Lord God, I thank you um, for the privilege of standing here. Thank you for your word. And I pray that we wouldn't just hear it today. That we would do it. That we would live it. And that we would not be satisfied until everyone around us has the opportunity to hear about it from us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We are in Romans 12. I know that's not the book of Revelation. Revelation 16 will commence next week. We'll get back into the book of Revelation and head to chapter 22 and finish that up in the weeks to come. But uh, coming off of not preaching for a month, I felt like I, I had some things I wanted to say that, uh, that I, the timing seemed appropriate. So I want to do that, and then we'll get back to it. So Romans 12, 1 and 2. Um, so there's a lot of change in our world going on. That's not new. That's not news. But if you watch the news, there's just, it seems like every day, there's something else unexpected, and it just kind of makes you want to just find something stable to hold on to uh, because it feels like so many things are, are shaking. I'll give you a fun example, a little more fun example of this. Um, uh, that, that is college football. If you've been paying attention, or maybe even if you haven't been, you know that college football is talking about going from a four-team playoff to a 12-team playoff. And, of course, there's all kinds of opinions on that, and everybody's spending time sharing those with especially your, your sports fans. Another thing that has been happening is the realigning of conferences or teams leaving one conference to go to another, Texas and Oklahoma going to the SEC, for example, and there's a good chance that that's not over. In fact, it may just be the beginning of this. And this shakeup of college football has some people pretty shaken, unnerved, and it's, it's kind of humorous, I think, because it's just a game, right? Just a game with lots of dollar signs attached to it, though. So it matters, and lots of alumni are tied to it as well. Emotion, and there's money, and there's all this going on. And so I really appreciated Coach Dabo Sweeney's words when he was asked about all these changes and what did he think, and, he, and of course he's never going to be shy giving his opinion. But what he said I thought was really important for us to think about because I think it's true for us because we're living in a world that's shaking and uncertain and changing, and we don't have a lot of control. And he said, you know, there's a lot of things I can't control. We're just going to play the teams they, tell, they schedule for us to play. We're going to play by the rules they tell us to, to play by. We're going to do basically what we are, have set out to do from the beginning. And he's talking about who we are. We're a college football team. We're uh, a group of people who are trying to build men, boys into men, through the sport so that it's more about more than the sport. And um, we're, just, we're going to go out and we're going to do the best we can with that. We're going to control what we control. And we're going to leave the rest for someone else. And in the case of college football, I tremble at that a little bit when I think of who's in control of college football. But when I think of life, I do not tremble other than in fear and reverence and awe of Almighty God, who is in control, and that should be mind-boggling to us. And it should be comforting to us in Christ. Now, if you're not in Christ, I don't know if that's, probably not comforting. It might be terrifying because you realize, oh, if there is a God and I'm not him, um, that means that I've got to face him one day. And that's not a comfortable feeling if you don't have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So what I wanted to do today is just answer this question. And, and this question is, is the kind of question we kind of go back to when things get rocky in life, when things get shaky. We kind of ask the question, among other questions, uh, what's God's will for my life? And we think about the changes in our culture, and we think there's, there's patterns in our world that are cyclical, cyclical and repeat and create these problems that we're experiencing. We're not experiencing any problems that are really unique to humanity other than the, um, I guess, the technical nuance to, to it. But at the end of the day, we're sinners, and we act like sinners because we're born sinners. And that's been the problem from the beginning. And it's still a challenge and a problem. So how do, we, how do we determine or discern the will of God in life? I don't know what you're going through, 
but a lot of you are going through a lot. And it would be very natural and very understanding for you to ask the question, well, what's the point in all of this? And, and then even then, if you, you were to say, okay, I understand the point is to glorify God, but what's His will for me in my life? So we're going to tackle that because in these two verses, among other things, and we're going to look at that, and I think you're going to find the answer is pretty straightforward, maybe even easy to understand, but in one sense impossible to live, and in another sense it's possible if you are willing to trust and do it through Jesus Christ. So with that, let's jump in. So this verse says, is uh, in, the, in the beginning of chapter 12 which if you study, study the book of Romans, you know that this is kind of the, the peak of the writing. He, he builds, 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 and he's saying, you know, here's the truth, here's, here's, what, I, here's what I want you to believe, here's what I want you to understand, this answers the question why, and then when he gets there, he turns and pivots to, now here's what I want you to do about it. Kind of mirrors our questions we should be asking ourselves. What is God saying to me, and what am I going to do about it? So at this point, he, 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 he swings from, here's what I want you to believe, to here's what I want you to do. Okay? Here's who I want you to be. Here's how I want you to live. Okay? Be like Christ. Now do like Christ. Identity, our theology based on that foundation, and the practice of living out that identity. If this is who I am, then this is how I live. Okay? And this hinge point on the word, therefore, is, is, that, is, is making that happen. Okay, so the word therefore, we always say, whenever you see the word therefore in Scripture, you always ask the question, what's the therefore, therefore? And the answer is really summarized in verses 1 and 2, but he'll go on to through chapter 16 and giving you lots of detail. So this is how it goes. So if you're following along, therefore, I urge you, brothers, or in some translations, brothers and sisters, because that's the context, believers. So Paul writes, therefore, in light of chapters 1 through 11, in light of, because they would have read this in one sitting, they would have gathered and probably at some time read through the whole thing, even though they would have preached a little at a time like we do. Um, their services were probably a little longer than ours in the early church, uh, like all day. Um, so um, therefore, in light of all that we've talked about in the first 11 chapters of Romans, I urge you, I plead with you, I beg you. There's an intensity here. And he said, I beg you, I urge you, in view of God's mercy, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, which he talks about in those first 11 chapters, I'll come back to that, offer your bodies. That would be another way of saying offer yourself. Offer your lives as a living sacrifice. Now, the Jews would have had a picture of the sacrificial system here, offering lambs, even though they weren't doing that at this time. They would have, right? And that's, you're giving an, an animal and it's slaughtered and offered. So that's, that's a, a living sacrifice that doesn't end up being alive. And that's the picture. He's, he's like, I want you to offer your life as it is to me and let me do what I'm going to do with it. And if that means you lose it, that's okay. That's appropriate. And, and that's really what he calls us to. And Jesus called us. If you look at the, the Gospels, Jesus said, come and see, come and follow me. But he also said, come and die with me. Okay, metaphorically, but knowing that also sometimes it's literally like it was for him. He led by example. He's not calling us to do anything that he hasn't already done, that he wasn't willing to do, that he didn't choose to do. Now, he didn't choose to do it in the sense that that was his idea. He chose to do it because the Father sent him to do that, and he loves his Father so much he's going to obey him in life and in death. And that's what he calls us to do. Follow me. Walk in my ways. So therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy... To offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, why would you do that? Why would you offer yourself as a living sacrifice? Now remember the questions we're trying to answer. What is God's will for me, and how do I break out of this, this world system of, of brokenness? 
we're finding ourselves in. He's going to answer that question in these two verses, okay? But you need to understand why you would actually do this for this to make sense. So I'm going to tell a story I've told many times that some of you have not heard, so I get to tell it because there's at least one person here that has not heard the Indian chief story, okay? So there was a tribe, and there was an Indian chief of that tribe, and the tribe loved their chief because he was just and he was good and merciful. He did what, and they trusted him. And he was noble and good. And they had a good tribe, and, and the tribe functioned well, and it was, people got along, and they cared for one another. But there, there, there so happened that there was someone stealing. Someone began to steal. Now, they had rules and laws, and they would take care of those things, but this person didn't get caught, and they stole again. They didn't get caught, and they stole again, and they didn't get caught. And so the chief realized, I've got to do something because we're not catching them and they're getting more and more courageous in what they're doing. And so he, he decided he was going to make the crime, the punishment for the crime, if you were caught, so severe that it would hopefully cause somebody to not ever do it again. And it was basically, we're going to beat you with a whip until you're almost dead kind of punishment. So the, the, the stealing stopped for a while. Everybody thought it was solved until somebody stole again but this time the person was caught and to everyone's horror it was the chief's mother so everybody's like oh what is he going to do and there were some that were saying oh, he's going to show mercy he, he's he's always just we can cut him some slack one time he can compromise and just we who would blame him it's his mom right Others were like, no, he's good and just, and he will carry it out because that's what he does. He's going to be consistent. He's not going to compromise. Yeah, but he loves his mom, but he's just. Day came, he pronounces sentence, and to carry it out, the punishment. And so the whole tribe turns out for this. And they have this pole in the center, and a brave warrior is there with a whip ready to execute judgment if that should be the case and uh, justice, uh, punishment, and the chief says uh, the, the thief is guilty and we will punish accordingly. And so they take, and it gasps, and people are just in shock, and they take her and they strap her to this pole, and, and she's, you know, back, just kind of thinking, okay, here we go, I might not even survive this. And the brave, the warrior's got the whip in his hands, about ready to start, and the chief says, wait. And he walks over to his mom, looks at her in the eyes, and then he wraps his body around her and the pole. And he says, okay, now you can begin justice. And the brave warrior began to whip and whip. And he absorbed the blows that she deserved. She knew she was guilty, right? He knew she was guilty. Everybody knew she was guilty. Everybody knew who deserved that. But he took the punishment, the innocent one, the one who actually is known as just and merciful, and he, he found a way to not make it either or, justice or mercy. He found a way to make it either, to make it justice and mercy. Justice was still carried out, wasn't it? But so was mercy. That's the cross. That's the cross. That's why we sing about the cross. Because justice and mercy meet at the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, he died in my place for my sins so I wouldn't have to. He died in your place so that you wouldn't have to. I imagine she never stole again. <laughs> I imagine their relationship was amazing from that point on. And that's the whole point, is that our relationship with a God who loves us, who we betrayed and stole and everything else in the book, and he made it possible for us to be punished for our sin, but not us, somebody in our place, and so we could receive mercy. Now, let me ask the question, why would anybody live a life as a living sacrifice? Oh, it's not hard to answer that question now, is it? Because of what he did for you and me. Why wouldn't you want to be a living sacrifice for that kind of a God? 
That's amazing. It's amazing grace. Which is why we sing that. Because it's amazing. But we forget, right? The memory fades and we get used to hearing the language and we go, yeah, 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 whatever, amazing grace. And it's not so sweet a sound anymore because we forget. Well, Paul says, I urge you in view of mercy to do what? To offer your body as a living sacrifice. To surrender. That's the word. Surrender your life. It's basically you crawl up on a cross and let Jesus say, and let God do whatever he would do with you. But God's not doing it just for the point of doing it. He's using you and I to the extent that we yield and surrender to him and let to take that story, that truth of mercy to the world that where everybody's backstabbing and attacking each other and he's going no it's it's not attack and win by power and be the most the strongest person in the country it's being the weakest it's surrendering it's loving people unconditionally no matter whether you agree with them or not it's loving the people that don't look like you it's loving the people that don't have the same political affiliation that you have or the philosophies on life or they don't have the same it's loving them Mercy, compassion. This is what God has called us to. It's not just a slogan. It's not just a sign. It's, it's the essence of what it means to walk with God. Look at Genesis 5. This is a detour. 5.24. I didn't give you guys that one. Genesis 5.24. It's one short verse. This, is, this guy's Enoch. His name's Enoch. And Enoch is in line of the earliest people who ever lived. And, of course, in the genealogies, they always just talk about the men, mostly. And this is, uh, so this is before Noah. So this is before Methuselah, after Adam, obviously. And it says, Enoch walked faithfully with God, and then he was no more. Because God took him away. So... I'm just grabbing a tissue. I'm not attacking the front row here. Um, so Enoch did not die. Did he? And the Lord took him. He died. He didn't die. He just took him. So it was like he's walking with God, and God's like, you want to just keep going? And he was like, yes, I'm in. And so he just walked on home with, with God. So those are one of the, he's one of the two that didn't die in Scripture, Elijah being the other. Why? Do I show you that? I show you that because I want you to see the essence of the, of the life that God has called you to in me. He's called us to walk with him. Just walk with me. Walk with me. Walk with me in my words, in my ways, in my works. All right, back to Romans 12. Therefore, in view, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. And then he defines what that sacrifice quality is. Holy and pleasing to God. And there's a lot of things I could probably say here. I'm only going to say two. One is holy is set apart, pure, undefiled from what's common. And that would be anything else in the world. So set apart. We are, as a living sacrifice, supposed to be a sacrifice that is set apart. That means that our, our lives should be set apart. We should live in such a way that we're not trying to call attention to ourselves in the sense that we're trying to be holier than thou. That would be, that would be pride. But what we are trying to do is, be, is recognize that left to our own devices and our own fleshly desires, we're going to be anything but holy. We're going to do unholy things. And so we're going to discipline ourselves in the power of God's Spirit, so that we are blameless in the way that we live. God he makes us holy through Jesus Christ. That's, he does that positionally through the cross when we trust Him. In practice, we're not so good at living up to that, are we? There's a gap between what He has done for us and where we are. We're trying to close the gap. That's called discipleship. Sanctification is the theological term. But, you know, you are holy. That's why Paul calls us saints all over the Bible. We don't feel like saints because we're down here. We know how we live. But he says, but you should walk as a living sacrifice towards this ideal, which is Jesus. Okay? So why should we want to be a living sacrifice? Because of his mercy. Now you're starting to see the answer to the question, what's the will of God for my life? Ah, surrender would be top of the list. That would be the first if you're taking notes. That would be point number one. 
surrender, that's the first way to know the will of God, and then we've broken it down in know His mercy, that's the motivation, okay? And then you do it as someone who is dying to self daily. Jesus said, if anyone come after me, he must first deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Luke 9.23, okay? So that's, uh, the, that's Jesus' version of this verse, I guess you could say. This, and then he says this. This is your true and proper worship. What is true and proper worship? Living surrendered, sacrificially for a good and great, merciful God. Okay? Some translations say this is your spiritual act of worship. This is your reasonable service, other translations say. All of those translations are beautiful. They all get around the many facets of this diamond that is worship. Okay? All right. So, how do I discern the will of God? Number one is I surrender all to this great and good God who is a God of mercy. And then how, I give you the other way is that you don't, verse 2, conform to the pattern of this world. Now, when he says don't, he's also going to give you a do, all right? So there's going to be a turn here. So you could call it two sides of the same coin or two coins facing each other, whatever. So let's, let's look at this. So verse 2, after you've done that, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Now, the pattern of this world is what we're trying to break free from, where we're all trying to be right, and we're all arguing our case. I mean, just, right, just go to Facebook news, news feed, and you can see what that looks like. The pattern of this world is to attack and to blame and to not take responsibility, okay? It, it's, it's a bunch of us telling other people what they think they should do, and we're not even taking care of our own junk. I mean, that pretty much defines America right now. It feels like maybe the whole world. Okay? So don't do that. Conform to the pattern is this idea of being pressed into a mold. So when our kids were growing up, they had Play-Doh. They had lots of Play-Doh, and they had these, all these, you know, the paraphernalia you can now get because Play-Doh wants to make more money, and so you'll buy more Play-Doh if you have these things that roll the Play-Doh, and you can so it like makes an impression on there. It's pressing into a mold into the Play-Doh, or play, push the Play-Doh into the mold. That's the word we're here. Do not conform. Don't be conformed to that mold the world of the world. Okay? It, it feels like Paul's saying, I'm going to tell you what you need to do, but I've got to tell you what you need to stop doing because we're really hard. We're really, we have a really hard time doing the right thing, either the wrong thing or even just good things and settling and not doing the best. Paul's like, stop it. M probably, I, I imagine Paul coming in going, you know, if I could tell you what not to do, I could probably look at your life and tell you, don't do 90% of what you're doing right now. It's just... Just don't do it. And, I, and I'm thinking, well, does that mean quit my job? No, it does, not, it's not what we're saying. It's, it's how you live the life you're living, whether you're at work or at home or um, even if you're asleep. What are you doing with the 24 hours a day, the 168 hours a week that he's giving you? What are you going to do with that? How are you spending that? Because that's what that is. You realize you're stewarding time. You're doing it well or poorly. Me too. Take ownership. Take responsibility. Start with being willing to tell yourself what not to hear words of discipline and responsibility, and we're all cringing because we don't want that. But we should want that, and we need that. It's life-giving. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. That is the systems of this world. That is the philosophies of this world. Because who's running this world? Who's the prince of darkness? Who's the one in power of this world right now, right? And it's him, his legions, his philosophies, and it's the flesh. And it's all of these things are fighting against the Spirit of God who lives in his people and gives us everything we need to push back. But, it, but it's like God is a gentleman, and he's like, but you have to want it. Right? It's like having a, a brother who's trying to stop drinking so much. And he's like, God, make me stop drinking as he's holding his Budweiser. Stop, make, make me stop. God's not going to knock it out of your hand most of the time. Now, there are times when God has a great sense of humor and he might knock it on you just to make him have to go change or whatever. But you know what I'm saying? He wants you to own your part of this, and that is put forth some effort 
and cooperate with me, I'm not going to do it for you. I'm going to do the heavy lifting for you, 99.9% of what it's going to take to do it, but I'm not going to, because if I do it for you, you didn't do it. And so you're not going to learn to do it the next time you're tempted. And you're going to blame me, God says, instead of you taking ownership. This is disciplining, disciplining adults that need to be, they're acting like children, right? Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but here's the switch. Here's what we should be doing, and it is be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How are we going to break free from the pattern of this world? We're going to break free by surrendering to the transforming words, ways, and works of Jesus Christ. When we submit and surrender to the transforming power of God's Word, it will renew our minds, and when your thinking changes, your belief system changes, and when you start walking in, the, in step with God in the right beliefs, it affects how you behave, and it affects how you feel. You start to feel good. Happiness flows from holiness. You realize that, right? You're not truly going to be happy unless you're walking in holiness. And you're like, well, no, oh, holiness means I can't do anything fun. No, holiness means you can't do anything destructive to yourself and others. That sounds like good news to me. So do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do we renew our minds, okay? Our minds, you add to your mind through the senses, right? Right? I'm just focusing on what I see and what I hear for now because that's where we tend to get the most information from. Things we hear, you're taking in things right now through your ears. If you're reading Scripture on the screen, you're taking in things through your eyes. And that's right now, I'm hoping that that's good, that what you're taking in is good and it's going to lead to transformation because of your mind being renewed as you process and think through this. And, and when you walk out, you don't forget it because you've made some notes and, and you're, you're processing it and you're saying, I, I need, to, I need to, to discipline my life to fall underneath this authority because this is good. Not me, God, His Word. Okay? That's how it happens. That's how we break free from this pattern of the world that we live in. That's how you are able to actually surf through the newsfeed on your Facebook page and not leave just totally stressed out, distressed, angry, ready to throw something at the screen. You know, that's how you're able to go through and your and compassion for those people that are behaving and however they're behaving is replacing your anger. Compassion, mercy. And you're like, where'd that come from? Oh, wait. In view of God's mercy. Yeah. Okay? Then here's the answer, the big answer, or the most direct answer to the question, well, how do I discern God's will for my life? When you let God renew your mind and transform, then you will be able to what? Test and approve what God's will is. What does it mean to test and approve? If you're inspecting it. You're discerning you're, you're looking at it going, is this God's will or not? And that's a, that takes some practice, right? When I was younger in my faith, it was a whole lot harder for me to discern God's will. Part of the reason that's true is because I didn't know God's will. Because 90% of it's written down. Probably 98% of it's written down, I'll just be honest. If we did this, the other 2% I think would be so obvious, we probably would come up with it ourselves. You'll be able to discern what God's will is. You say, well, it doesn't say in there where I'm supposed to go to college, doesn't it? Does God not give you the principles and the wisdom to make those kinds of decisions? Think about it as, as, a, as a parent or as a kid. As you grew older in a relatively healthy parenting situation, boundaries got wider and wider and you were given permission to do more and more. And that was because, at least in theory, you were maturing, okay, in your faith. And so that they were trying to allow you to make some mistakes where it's still safe, but at the same time learn to take on the wisdom, the, the process of learning how to discern, how to make wise decisions and choices. So by the time they leave to go to, to college or start their first job, they, ha they aren't coming out of this really narrow, you have no freedom, I'm telling you everything to do, because they don't know what to do. This is happens to prisoners when they come out of prison. When they've been in prison for 30 years, and they come out, and all they've had for 30 years is people telling them exactly what to do. They have almost no freedom. That's kind of the point. But when they come out, 
out. They don't, they're not equipped to make decisions because they haven't been. They don't get to decide where they're going to sleep, when they're going to sleep, when they're going to eat, what they're going to... They don't get to choose. Okay, So as a parent, we, with fear and trembling, we widen the boundaries and let our kids get more moved towards adulthood so that they will mature and learn how to make those decisions. God's doing the same thing with you and me. We're his kids. It makes sense, right? Sons and daughters of God, remember who you are. Because everything you do flows from who you think you are. And if you think you're this superstar student, then when you fail, you're gonna, your life's going to be crushed. Dave Dravecki tells the story in his book, Comeback is the first book, and he talks about when he lost his ability to pitch in the major leagues. Now, a pitcher, to get to the major leagues, think of all the things you have to do to get to be a pitcher in the major leagues, right? You have to start when you're so small you're not even walking. And, you, you know, the dad's putting the ball in your hand because he wants you to feel the leather and smell the rawhide and know this is where your destiny is. And the, so you go through all the club teams and all this, and your whole life revolves around throwing and catching and hitting. And then you're a pitcher, so now you're a god amongst baseball players. And you get to the major leagues, and you pitch, and your arm snaps because of cancer. Talk about an identity crisis. And he went through that. Crushed him, but not completely because he had a relationship with God that was strong enough to help him recognize what was happening in his life, and he got on track. And so his second book is When You Can't Come Back, because he actually, uh, it's, it's an old book, so spoiler alert, he comes back from that first break. No, it wasn't a break, from the cancer, and then he breaks it the second time. And that's the second book, and that's the story. We actually got to meet him. He came and shared it in our church, and he was at a very low point. He actually writes about it in the second book. And he was coming to speak to our church about all this. But the dude was as low. I mean, he was lower than the carpet. He was so low. Taking him back to the airport, I was just depressed. He was, I was like, what do, I, what do you do with that? Well, you find out and remind yourself, who are you? And then you go be that person, okay? If you're a son or a daughter of the king of kings, okay, you have authority and you have wealth and inheritance and a future where the best is yet to come. And you can live in this life, no matter how sour the lemons are, a whole lot differently when you know and believe that's true than when you don't. Amen. Yeah, that's good news. Unless you don't yet. Okay? And I'm going with the yet. So then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. And then he defines and describes God's will. And this is just a beautiful way to end it. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Okay, so God's will is good, which means there's no evil. It's untainted perfection. God's will. You know, well, I don't know. I don't, God might send me to Africa. That's the, uh, it's either that or China that we don't ever want to go to. I don't remember. You know, if I give my life to God, he's going to send me to some God-forsaken place. Well, that would be part of the mission. So that might happen. But when you understand God's mercy, you're willing to be that person, right? That's why people actually go. You're like, I can't believe these people go into the mission field. Well, that might be exactly, your words may never have been truer. I can't believe that these people go in the mission field. Maybe that's your problem. But it's not can't, it's won't. That's another time. Good, pleasing, and perfect. Pleasing. Why pleasing? That sounds enjoyable. Okay, I'll go with that. But I love Romans 11, 6, uh, um, Hebrews 11.6 because it reminds me that without faith, and that is without me practicing living out faith, it's impossible to please God. Well, who doesn't want to please God at the end of the day? Okay? If you're his son or daughter, you want to please him. You want him to say when you show up, well done, good job. Come on, let me introduce you to the rest of the family. You're here. Because the best is yet to come. Pleasing. God is pleased when you and I, remember Enoch? He just walked with God. Enoch just walked with God, and he did it so well. God's like, man, I really like you. Let's just skip that dying part, and let's just go. And Enoch's like, I don't know what it's like to die, but I'm with you. Wouldn't that be awesome? You know, Jesus could show up today, right? You realize he could come back the second coming of Christ. We could also miss that death thing. So maybe you should add that to your prayer list. I don't know. Good, pleasing, and perfect. Now, when we think of perfect, we think unblemished. But when I think of perfect, I also think of unchanging. It means he's already got it right, 
God's will for your life is already right, okay? Now, let's talk a little bit about God's will as we, as we land this plane, okay? So, there's, and, and I'm not really tight on all this, so this is just kind of, um, this is me telling you about God's will on a napkin, okay? On this side, we have God's providential will, and on this side, we have God's permissive will, Okay? Because sometimes we ask the question, well, is it God's will that I slap this person in front of me? Because I'm really ticked right now, and I just really want, you know, we're asking those kinds of questions. It's like, oh, no, love your enemy. It's already written down. He's already given you the answer to that question. But there's, there, that's in his permissive will, because some of us would justify, well, yeah, but he's really being annoying, so can I today, you know, and so that's permissive will. And we talked about that with the width of the boundaries. So sometimes God gives, you, you're asking God, what's your will for me? And he's going, he's, is it this or this? And you, he's going, well, those are both inbounds, so you can do either one. Can I go to Carolina or Clemson? Neither. But can, I go, can I go to Furman or CSU? Either one. They're both okay for you. They're both inbounds, right? But God's providential will is these are things that God has ordained, and these are going to happen whether you like it or not. Okay? God's sending Jesus. He's coming back. And the best is yet to come. This whole evil, suffering world we live in, temporary. Providential will. will. Nobody can change that. So a lot of the things that you and I are wrestling with are the things that fall over here in this permissive will category. Should I? Can I? So let me give you one more little bit of wisdom, and then we'll, we'll, we'll see if we can wrap this up. So when sometimes we ask the question, is this right? Is it, should I ask the question, God, is it right for me to do this? So sometimes we ask the question, is it this or this? And he says, okay, this one's out of bounds or not, or they're both in bounds. But sometimes yeah, we ask the question, is it right? And the better question we should be asking isn't, is it right or wrong? Because if they're both right, then I still have to make a decision. It's what's the wise thing to do? My daughter's already smiling because we, we use that line a few times in our house. Be wise when you walk out the door, right? What's the wise thing to do? Because the wise thing to do isn't always the thing we would choose, is it? <laughs> but it helps us because it's not right or wrong anymore. It's all those things that you're trying to decide what's the wise thing to do. That's just walking with the Lord is really the right answer, right? And if I choose the wise thing, I'm going to be walking with the Lord. I've got a better shot of being inside bounds of his permissive will. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So how do we discern God's will? We surrender to the transforming words, ways, and works of Jesus. And we don't conform to the pattern of this world, but we, we walk through that transformation process. Now, on Monday nights in August, we're going to help you with this to the extent that you want to be. Because this is, this is Christianity 101 stuff we're talking about. Okay? But it's hard to understand it clear enough to communicate it, articulate it to someone else. But yet, that's what we're called to do. Okay? And when things are unpredictable, uncertain in your life, the way you cut through it all is you remind yourself, what is the mission? By really asking yourself, who am I? Remember who you are, and that leads you to, well, I'm a son of God, or a child, a child of God, I'm a daughter of God, and, there, and I need Remember that as that son or daughter of God, I have God's word, I have God's spirit in me, and I have God's mission that, that directs me. So just think of all the horrible things that you're afraid of right now. And everybody's afraid of something, right? We're afraid of losing our rights. We're afraid of being told what to do by people who are wicked or evil or just stupid. We're, we're afraid of not passing a class. We're, we're uh, afraid of not having enough money. We're afraid of not being in control. We're afraid of not being liked by anybody, right? All those things. And so when that happens, bring it back and remind yourself, who am I? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a son or daughter of the king. Forever. That's not changing. Nobody can take that from me. Okay, I'm that. And, and he has equipped me and left me here in this world for a time to carry out his mission, and he's given me his word and his spirit, and I get to do it with other people that are on the same mission. Now, does that not give you focus when, it, when everything in this world is thrown at you? Everything from 
chronic illness to losing a child to losing a job to finding out there's a spot on your lung, to whatever. It gives you clarity. And now those things don't go away, right? Those problems aren't going to go away just because you said, oh, I'm God's son or daughter. But it gives you the sanity to go through them with your chin up and your eyes forward and peace in the midst of the storm. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. He said to the disciples after he told them he was leaving, do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. The opposite of love, the opposite of love is not hate, it's fear. So that should tell us something when we're operating in fear. So Monday nights in August, 6 o'clock, in this room, all are welcome. We're going to help you. How do I disciple people in a small setting? Okay? How do I just, how do I help people know Jesus? How do I people, uh, help people, how do I talk to people about this gospel thing? Okay? And, and we're going to just walk you through some real simple ways to do that, okay? All you'll need is a pen and a napkin at, at the end of the day to do what we're going to teach you to do, and a person on the other side of the table, okay? So I, 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 mean, I, want, I want students to come. I want children to be here to the extent that you're willing to try that. We're okay with a rambunctious room, okay? If you can't be here, we're going to Zoom it, and by invitation... So you've got to let me know you want to be invited. I'll send you the link and the password, okay? So you can message me if you've got my contact, or you can email info at gracetoday.net. Info at gracetoday.net. You do not have to know me. You do not have to be a part of our church to participate in the Zoom, but you do need to RSVP through info at gracetoday.net. And if you do that, you'll get to be a part of it each week. And we're going to have tables, and we're going to sit around tables, and some of your assignments are going to be around the table, and then we'll come back. And, and then you're actually going to have some homework. Now, students, you don't have homework because you already have homework. You have um, extra work. So I know that was a real sell there, wasn't it? All right. Okay, let's remember why we're here, right? We are here to be reminded of who we are and what it is we do because of who we are. So we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper in a minute at these two stations. And if you're if you're a believer in Christ, you don't have to be a member of this church. You get to come, and you just come down these aisles and just pick a side and get a cup of grape juice and a piece of bread broken off of a single loaf to remind us we are one body, many members, and so those pieces are already cut up for you, and you, you take that piece of bread as a reminder of the price for that mercy we talked about. The Indian chief paid the price, didn't he? By his wounds, she was healed. By Jesus' wounds, we are healed. Not just physically, but spiritually, eternally. And that's why we then go live the life he's called us to live. And discerning God's will along the way is part of that, but then you've got to go do it. And that's what that's about. So the cup of juice represents the blood of Christ, which reminds us he didn't just get beaten to a pulp. He didn't just get nailed to a cross. He died. He gave his life. He was dead three days. And then the tomb was empty on the third day because God saw that sacrifice and he said, that's good enough for me. And he raised him to life. And he says, anyone who trusts in my boy, I'm going to deliver to. I'm going to get resurrection to. And that's the hope we have. That's the hope we have in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the hope we have in your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the mercy that we receive because he took our place on the cross. We thank you for the grace of God that makes that gift available to anyone who would trust and believe in Christ Jesus. Lord, draw yourself. Draw some more. I, I'm, I'm just bring them to conviction of sin. And as we feel this guilt, this conviction, I pray that you would just remind everybody in the room that that's why Jesus died on the cross, so you could forgive our sins. And you've already done it to the extent in which we've asked. So Lord, help us to just believe that you want to forgive our sins, that you will forgive our sins. There is no sin so great that you will not forgive in this place. Help us to receive that. Help us to forgive ourselves. Help us to forgive those who have wounded us and not hold a grudge, but let's forgive them as we've been forgiven so that we can truly walk in freedom and peace and joy, happy and holy. 
Lord, as we remember the cross, may we go into our, our day, our week, and share that and invite people to follow us as we follow you, imperfectly though that will be. That's good enough. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.